So welcome to a very special show. Uh, this show is sponsored by the Society for Antiquarian Studies, a 501c3 nonprofit. Our guest tonight, or Dr. Richard Carrier, has a PhD in ancient history from Columbia University. Dr. Josh Bowen, a PhD in Assyriology from Johns Hopkins University. And Pat Lowinger, who has a master's in archaeology from the University of Leicester. And without further ado, let's bring them on. How are you gentlemen doing tonight? Huzzah. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hello, everybody. Good. Thanks for having us. All-star cast. Man, I feel special to be here. (laughs) So starting with you, Pat, tell us a little bit about yourself, your work, and where people can find you. Um, Well, uh, like you said, I'm... uh, finished an MA this uh, last year at the University of Leicester. I'm continuing on uh, research and pursuit of my PhD in ancient Mediterranean studies. My focus is really, my research focuses on the transmission um, of religious ideas, ritual, um, and how that's represented in material culture um, as far as projecting throughout the Mediterranean. Um, what happens when one group comes in contact with another and how traditions and religious rituals are adopted and then um, translocated out of a region into another um and i'm just happy to be here because i'm a little bit of a fanboy for both these good guys so (laughs) as am i uh dr carrier welcome back why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself as if the people don't know right (laughs) well uh yeah um for people who want to know all the things about me richardcarrier.info is my website and that has all the stuff uh, my about page and my books classes all the things i do uh, and my blog and my social media and all of that. But uh, for today, uh, we're going to be talking about ancient science, maybe a little bit of ancient technology. And my relevance to that is that was my PhD at Columbia University, is on um, attitudes towards the natural philosopher in the early Roman Empire, which I translate that as scientist. And I explain in the book, like I'm focusing on the natural philosophers that used a scientific method. So they're the most scientific scientists that they had back then. Um, <clears throat> And so that, that led to two books. I mean, one was the, the little tiny short book, which is Science Education in the Early Roman Empire. Uh, and that actually covers the whole education system. So if you want to study ancient education, even from biblical history perspective, it tells you what, what these authors of the Bible went through, uh, what kind of education they received. The book focuses on science content and even does pop culture, right? So like, like how would illiterate people learn things. Uh, and there's a lot of actually channels by which knowledge would filter down to the general public, even if they're illiterate uh, and, and so on. So I discuss all of those aspects of education and that. But then there's my big book, <laughs> which is The Scientist in the Early Roman Empire. Uh, both of these books constitute my dissertation. I just broke them out into education separately and then the monstrous book on the rest of it. Uh, who, who were these people in the Roman Empire? What, what, was, what was the state of science at that time? What did people think about scientists? Uh, like what, the vocabulary, the, the attitudes, the values, um, what was their place in society? So I, I do all of that and I include progress and I include uh, aspects of technology and its relationship to science and all of that uh, in that book. And I've done other articles and chapters on the subject of ancient science in various other venues. And if anybody's interested, he actually um, narrates his own book on Audible, which is yes. pretty cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, including those two books. Yeah, uh, I've, yeah. I've not done my last book, but all my science books are, are on Audible, read by me. I uh, wish I would have found the shorter one um, because I was trying to finish the larger <laughs> one in time for the show, and that didn't happen. Uh, but it's been fantastic up to this point, though. I've enjoyed it, so... And Dr. Josh, tell us a little bit about yourself and welcome back. Thank you. Uh, Yeah, I have no expertise in uh, ancient Mesopotamian science uh, because it's a very specialized area of the field. But um, uh, I'd hopefully be able to, you know, contribute enough to keep this thing uh, interesting from from my side. Uh, Interesting to hear about uh, Dr. Carey writing uh, on ancient education because my dissertation which I published uh, as a popular level book is also on ancient Mesopotamian education. Awesome. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, my PhD is from Johns Hopkins uh, in Assyriology. I minored in Hebrew Bible. Uh, so yeah, I just, I'm excited to be here. Talk about the ancient world. 
Absolutely. I appreciate you guys all being here. This is going to be a fun show, and I'm not going to ruin it for everybody. I'm going to let Pat direct the questions on here because he's far more qualified. So <laughs> I am going to. <laughs> Sorry, Pat. You know, I brought you here for a reason, and now you figured it out. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys and uh, get ready to take some notes. Um, well, so I, by full admission myself, um, uh, we were originally, um, Eddie had planned on having someone do his production. That person couldn't be here tonight. So he's mm -hmm. asked me to impromptu, uh, direct our conversation or at least the conversation at this point. So I have some talking points I'd like to do. And I'd actually want to start, uh, with you, Dr. Carrier. Um, I'm a fan of your work. Um, I will some point work it in how it relates to my work um but i'm familiar with your with writing both your books so um both which are good you know i'm one of those people i started with hodges that 70 year old that now 50 year old text published in the 1970s right um, yeah it's been updated several times um but really you know going back it seems that looking at the roman world we'll, just, we'll call it the greco-roman world for this point uh, from this mm -hmm. point forward the modern understanding of what science was seems to have really in the last 50 years maybe 60 years step taken several steps forward and with yourself and it being the focus of your research uh, for your dissertation why do you think that is why do you think people more modern people in, in recent times are paying more attention to what the ancient greeks and romans did as far as science and science education oh that's a good question i you know i haven't really thought of that uh i don't know um but there there has actually been like recently the last 20 years a huge flourishing of interest in ancient science and um i've even made the point uh unrelated to this in a, on a different discussion that uh, also, a lot of the leading scholars in, in ancient science are women. So this is actually one of those fields where there's a really good parity between men and women who have PhDs who are writing peer-reviewed works on ancient science. So it's, it's really exciting and cool. And I, I, a lot of great stuff's come out. And, and consequently, a lot of changes in our beliefs about uh, an understanding of the ancient scientific world has happened in the last 20 years because of this focus. Same with technology, too, by the way. Both issues... Um, are going on like ancient technology and ancient economics is these are all interrelated fields and they've kind of exploded the last 20 years um <clears throat> i don't know what led it what led to it what, uh, and i can explain how i got into it and i'm sure it's not the, at all the same reason <laughs> everyone else did because i came at it from the christian apologetic side right so um and then i just it, it was happenstance that i discovered all of this work that had been done just the 20 years prior to my or 10 years prior to my, my working on it and so it was a I had a wealth of new scholarship to rely on. It was actually quite excellent. Uh, these aren't supposed to be any gotcha questions. They're just, you know, a few I jotted down. No, um, uh, as for oh, myself, yeah. um, my interest, my interest in science in the ancient world, you know, in addition to, you know, graduate level coursework, just learning in generalities about that. Um, I was, I'm going to ask you another question and, and this um, want Dr. Josh to weigh in too. I was actually somewhat, surprised at the intersection between religious charlatanism, um, particularly uh, my, my, my good friend, hero of Alexandria and technology. And mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you're willing to, I thought that would be a good place to start uh, talking about how science was sometimes mysterious and allowed people to enjoy the mysteries, so to speak. Um, yeah, and, it, it was uh, uh, <clears throat> religion was big business back then, right? So uh, it was one of the forefronts of technology was in, in the religion, religious technology it actually was. Yeah, they're, they're building all kinds of wonders and things that could impress the crowds, basically. Uh, a variety of different contraptions and devices. Uh, and, and Heron of Alexandria is most known for, for that, but he's not the only one to have written books on that subject. He's, he's the, the one that survives uh, most intact. But um but yeah, yeah, that's uh, they did a lot of different things. In fact, the the first proper vending machine uh, is Heron of Alexandria for dispensing holy water, so they could uh, right. redistribute personnel. They didn't have to have people portioning out holy water per coin. You just drop in a coin of a certain value, and, and a certain amount of holy water would come out of the machine. And that was <laughs> just sort of practical business of running your temple uh, that that he was supplying uh, examples for and tech for. My my favorite though for um, you know the religious uh, is the 
bladder contain the, the 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 iron bladder or copper bladder containing water um, underneath the altar. So when you light the altar on fire, it causes the pneumatic pumps and the doors to the temple to open. Uh, you know, and it, and given enough time and enough ritual activity, all of a sudden, magically, the door yeah. is open, uh, right. and then people can be ushered into the temple. Um, Things like that are just fascinating, and mm. I, I wonder how much that played in the general level of credulity in the ancient world, particularly during um, the time we're talking about here on in Alexandria, um, the first century CE, <laughs> particularly. Well, you know, we don't get his work. Or, we don't get to hear the voices of the people who are most likely to have been duped, right? So we don't know if they were conscious of what was going on or if they were actually fooled. Uh, I, I have a, a sneaking suspicion that they were not actually fooled, but they were impressed, right? So the, the technology created a, a, an air of awe, regardless of whether they, they knew it was a trick or not. Um, but there's some evidence that, that, that they, some of them actually, some of the people did actually think it was a trick. We have, uh, or didn't know it was a trick. Uh, we have Plutarch's uh, essay, Advice for Bride and Groom, uh, and he has a whole section on the bride and how, how women who are going to be married should be educated. You should look for an educated wife. Uh, and, and he has a whole science uh, uh, literacy part in there where he says, like, women who understand astronomy and who understand science won't be fooled by these witches who claim they can call down the moon with spells and stuff like that. Uh, so, so in order to inoculate yourself from hucksters... Uh, you need a science education. So make sure your wife has a good science education. And that, that was the, so and that indicates that there were people who were actually falling for some of the, these, this trickery, but um, I don't know how widespread that actually was. Uh, but the, the elites of course knew it was just technology and it was just impressive. It was just a, right. in, to them, it was kind of like conspicuous consumption. It was a way to show how, how brilliant and uh, resourceful they are and how much, how much resources they had to spend on lavishness essentially there were even parades there were parades with like automaton like uh like parade floats with robots that that did things and they had like self, seemingly self-propelled snails and uh, like all kinds of this kind of things that they would have uh they had a ship that would propel itself uh by people like, kind of like basically bicycles inside the ship but it would have oars rowing so it would like look like it was rowing through the air across the road uh, so they did a lot of these things just for pageants, just for, to show off, essentially. Uh, this was a big, bigger part of the ancient world than I think people are aware of. Well, since you brought up Plutarch, I'm going to skip down a couple questions, come back to a couple that we're going to be back um, talking about, particularly science education. Um, he makes a point that I think in the text is pretty clear that he equates skepticism and science as nearly synonymous. The, yeah. you know, not giving in to credulity. Um, given that, um, do you see science as being opposed in some ways to supernatural causation about uh, around the time of the Roman empire? Are you seeing an emergence of that in your own? Oh society? yeah, absolutely. I mean, it happened before the Roman empire, but it becomes, it even becomes codified in the law, right? So Roman law, they had a, um, they kind of kind of like a state subsidy system for their healthcare system where they would fund a certain number of doctor positions in certain cities based on the size of the city and stuff like that. Uh, and there were, they were, you know, quacks and hucksters and, you know, faith healers were trying to get these slots, basically try to get these subsidized salaries. Uh, and the law evolved to actually pr prohibit that. And it literally has a distinction between scientific medicine and quackery. And it's like, no, those, those are hucksters. They do not deserve these positions. It only has to be scientifically educated doctors. So the state had become aware of, like, almost to the point of licensing. I mean, they didn't really, they, weren't, they didn't have medical licenses per se, uh, but they did have basically kind of a vetting procedure that, that really took seriously, were you scientifically educated as a doctor or not? Uh, and so, so that was that part, of, part of this. So you have the skepticism right there of, like, faith healers, that's just hucksterism. That's quackery. But met, re, scientific medicine, that's real healing. And so you have that distinction, and you see it everywhere else in society and in the different it, it's among the elite of course and this became a part of friction between the educated elite and the masses who were much more superstitious and did not like scientists you know debunking and explaining away uh their religious uh, mysteries and their miracles and things like that so so you had a lot of that tension i write about this in the scientist in the early roman empire i have sections on on how the public did was not too happy about scientists in this regard but yeah that scientists saw themselves in this role was to explain things through nature rather than uh, the supernatural. But then you have, you have a few um, interesting science 
d directions like the Stoics, right? You have Stoic scientists, which you don't have a lot of treatises from, but we have discussions of. But they were trying to provide scientific explanations for religious phenomena that were actually supportive of the religion. So they were trying to develop a science of divination, a science of astrology, to give them like like they have to try to invent like plausible psionic or whatever mechanisms by which these things would work through natural causation, right? So they're they trying to justify these things through through ex scientific methods and uh, experimentation. We have the dream interpreter, Artemidorus is an example where he wrote this book on how to interpret dreams, like prophetic dreams. And he describes an entire scientific method there where he like does a massive collection of case studies, does kind of like a, a simplified statistical analysis of correlations between dreams and outcomes. And so he tries to actually mimic the methods of science to give a scientific defense uh, prophetic dream uh, science. So, and, and if, <laughs> so if I remember correctly, it's something like a flow chart too. As you read through it, it's kind of like if you have this, you have that. Um, right. And he yeah. kind of put Freud to shame in many ways about you know what symbols <laughs> and different things mean. He's the um, we don't have time yeah. to do it, but I'm. Yeah, um, we don't have time to do it, but since you denigrated witchcraft, which is one of the areas that I study, um, <laughs> I will. Uh, I will say that uh, the witches of Thessaly. Um, we're, we're, we're known to be the best poolers and drawdowns downs of the moons in antiquity. So I'm mm -hmm. going to defend them. Um, <laughs> moving forward though, um, I do kind of, since both of you have studied and, and talked quite a bit about education, um, I do want to pull Josh in here because he's been quiet and avoiding speaking at all. Um, but starting with education, the attitudes generally towards education, to education, literacy in society. Um, I would like to hear, I think the audience uh, would like to hear a little about education, both from a Mesopotamian, um, generally speaking, and a Greco-Roman point of view. Um, and you know, if you two would take a couple minutes, maybe, and kind of give a, a thumbnail sketch of what an education would look at at a certain time um, in antiquity, um, I, I, I think it would the audience would appreciate it. So we'll start. I'm going to go first, just for chron yeah, chron no, chronological purposes. Yeah, yeah chronological right, chronology, yeah. man. Good. Sorry if you hear my son screaming in the background. Um, uh, he does not want to go to bed. Um, yeah. So the uh, you know we have a lot of information about um, scribal education in uh, the early second millennium and then in the first millennium. But but the uh, sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear that. But it's only faintly. It's, um, it's not interrupting. You're all right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, basically, um, you know, scribal education in the early second millennium was at sort of at the household level. So we think that probably in the late third millennium, it was much more organized by the state, you know, much more part of the bureaucracy on a larger scale. Uh, but the archaeological evidence that we have um, for for education in that early part of the second millennium is you know, much more at the household level. But essentially what scribes did uh, to, uh, you know, to learn their craft uh, was they copied. They, they copied out, um, you know, simple sign lists, cuneiform sign lists. Uh, then they started memorizing and copying out these long vocabulary lists, um, syllable lists, you know, things that... Um, you know, these vocabulary lists would have all kinds of different terms, terms about, you know, nature, legal terms, terms that you'd use in letters, just different nouns, you know, uh, trees and rocks and anything that they might use, um, you know, to to write out uh, about, you know, what's going on um, in, in reality around them. And then they started learning uh, toward the middle, you know, uh, the middle part of the educational process, they'd copy out mock letters, uh, mock like model contracts, uh, proverbs. Proverbs have sort of pithy grammatical structures, so they start to get some grammar, but it's not long sentences and uh, paragraphs. Uh, but and after they did, you know, those sorts of things, then they start moving on to copying out from memory uh, pieces of literature. Uh, but they also had mathematical texts that they copied. Um, uh, so a, a, anyway, there's a lot that went into um, what they, you know, how they learned. But that was it. It was memorization, copying out from memory uh, in order to to develop that that skill. 
to be a scribe, an effective scribe. Was this all impressed clay, or did they use other mm-hmm. writing materials? The evidence that we have is for the pressed clay. I mean, we have like recycle bins uh, where you, right. you actually have, <laughs> you know, the clay sitting there soaking in its archaeological context in situ. But um, yeah, those, I don't, those are the best because those finds tell you so much about uh, the culture yeah. and psychology. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit upon, you said mathematics, um, any, uh, also this would include text regarding, you know, medicine and science, right? That would be copied and, and transmitted as well. No. Yeah. I mean, so the lists themselves, like I, I, uh, math is all is math and science, right? The two things that I probably should have mastered going through school. I didn't, but, um, so asking me about it. Thanks a lot, Pat. Um, <laughs> no, but, uh, certainly in the lists of, you know, vocabulary and terms and, uh, is th- those types of things would be copied out. They, they copied out. So, so much of the science, uh, the strict science, um, that you see is, you know, sort of this, um, you know, looking at divination, divination plays in quite heavily, I think. Uh, but as far as medicine is concerned, I haven't looked at the lists in detail, all of the different lists. But I'm sure that those those terms show up. Um, but yeah, I, I can't comment on them much more than that. Okay. Um, Dr. Carrier? Yeah, uh, so it's very similar. Of course, once you get to the Greco-Roman period, they're relying a lot on ink. So uh, papyrus and vellum, so like sheepskin, were the two primary modes of writing but for schoolwork oftentimes you just use broken pot charts right you just break a pot up and you have like these little post-it notes and you would practice your your work on on those right uh mathematical education you would use sandboxes you would trace things in sand uh, and do your equations and stuff that way uh which of course none of that survives but we have descriptions of it that's how we know people talking about that and then wax tablets that's another the, the most number one thing that student carried around would be this basically a, a several sheet or several sheet board of, you know, wood with wax on it. And then you have a metal stylus with different, with a smoothing side and a writing side, and you would write in the, in the wax, and then you could smooth it out and rewrite, re, rewrite in the wax. Um, instead of, for example, in the, you know, 19th century America, they went to chalk and slate. Right. Um, but, uh, but back then it was wax and stylus, uh, but it was, cause that was more like the art of actually doing of inking. So, Anyway, yeah, so that, that was one change. Uh, and then, yeah, it, off, it started in the family. So you're the equivalent of primary school, your basic literacy. The family was expected to provide it. Now, there were some later in the Roman Empire, there were, or when we get to the Roman Empire, there were some subsidies for families to help put their kids, uh, get their kids educated. But they weren't a lot, uh, basically. And some ph- philanthropists funded schools. Uh, in their hometowns. So they had like endowed schools for all the, all the children. Uh, it's sometimes just the males, but sometimes both uh, men and women, boys and girls would go to these schools. So we had a lot of that going on. And I talk about all of that uh, in there, but they would start with just the ba- basics of literacy and basic arithmetic. Uh, and then you would get into more complex grammar. And then like, uh, like Josh was saying, like they would just start copying things. So uh, you just copy out Homer or you would copy out Socrates or something like that. And then, of course, the next level, when you get higher up, you, it's more creative. Now you're saying, like, now make up something that sounds like Isocrates or tell a story, but use use this as a model, but, but retell it in a different context or something like that. So they get compositional skill. And then uh, at the high, at the highest level, of course, then you go into law or, or the sciences. So there was, there was a stage where you could take a certain suite of scientific uh, training, geometry, astronomy, uh, music theory actually was big. Uh, and, and, and then most of the, there wasn't really edu- medicine didn't really come up in general education. You had to go to specifically medical schools or apprentice under an actual scientific doctor to get medical training. Uh, so that, th- but there wasn't a lot of medicine in general ed, but there was astronomy, uh, was definitely a big thing, uh, in general ed. So there was a lot more astronomical knowledge, but that's so tied to agriculture that that was one of the reasons. That, and, and of course they could see the sky, uh, more than a weekend. So, uh, the sky was more relevant, uh, you know, the stars and the moon and the, the way the sun moves and the way the shadows move, all of that stuff was relevant to them, uh, in their daily lives. So, uh, so that, that became part of the education, but it was, 
you know, a narrower group of students would get this particular kind of education as you went on because uh, it got more expensive uh, or, you know, you had to go make money. So you would just ditch out of education. You've got enough education to do what you want to do. And so you go do what you want to do. To go all the way was often quite expensive. You usually had to have a patron willing to fund your education or you had to have a wealthy family who, who supplied it. Although we noticed I did a, a survey of all the scientists we know about uh, in the Roman Empire and all of them. Uh, seem to come from the middle class. Uh, we have a lot of aristocrats writing about science, but not doing science. The actual doers of science typically, typically came from successful middle class families. So like Galen's father started out poor, became an engineer, and then made wealth you know, on his own through, through engineering and then funded Galen's medical education. So Galen came from this sort of middle, in between the super rich and, and the, the working class and comes from a working class family that, that made it good. And then he comes out of that uh, and lived himself off of a small endowment. Uh, so he wasn't like super wealthy, but he was wealthy enough that he didn't have to take fees for his work, but he, he did it anyway because he, he wanted the experience and the prestige and all of that. Uh, he, he saw every job that he got is an opportunity for scientific research. Uh, so he has a lot of fascinating tales where he gets opportunities to do studies on patients uh, or on animals or things like that through the course of his regular work. Well, this, I, I, I want both of you to just kind of discuss one of the interesting things from a Greco Roman context. And we talked, you're talking about astronomy and astrology, which was, they weren't separate disciplines in the ancient world. Um, the intersection between East and we'll call it West, roughly the Mediterranean. Um, it seems that both the Greeks and the Romans looked eastward often for their knowledge, and, and you know the the best astronomers came from the East. I.e., a lot of Weisman, data, by the way. They, yeah, you, you yeah. get a lot of references that they were they appreciated a lot of the precise observations that they could get from the Babylonians, for example. And in fact, they were able to make some amazing discoveries by using some of their the recorded data. So like precession of the equinoxes was discovered using observations of planetary positions that went all the way back like 2,000 years. Uh, and that's how they're able to find out that the Earth wobbles every 25,000 years or so, uh, like a top that wobbles, a spinning top. So that's why the, the uh, constellations rotate. So if you think you're a Sagittarius, you're probably not because uh, it moves uh, what, you know what what constellation rises in each month changes over this 25,000 year period uh, but they're able to discover that using Babylonian data uh, comparing it with theirs and, and, and so on so uh, th and they did appreciate this a lot uh, a lot of the uh, eclipse work eclipse prediction work relied on uh, Middle Eastern data from from prior eras when they didn't, they were poor in theory, but they were good in observation. And so when you get to the Greeks and Romans and they're super big on theory, uh, for which you need a lot of data uh, to, to tell things, uh, they were very appreciative and used a lot of the Babylonian and other uh, Eastern archives for this stuff. Yeah. Um, and my understanding, and if I'm wrong, correct me, is that, again, you're talking about the theory versus the data. The, the Babylonians being meticulous in their observations, but not necessarily understanding the theoretical implications, but they front loaded the data and then it got, the theory got done on the backside. Is, is yeah. How, and even in their predictiveness, uh, they would just build arithmetic, arithmetic models rather than physical models. Right. So they were looking for patterns that you could find mathematically, but they were less interested in the actual celestial mechanics of why those patterns existed. Uh, and it's the Greeks and Romans that started building actual models of the solar system or planetary system, depending on which side of that debate you were on back then. Uh, and, and so, yeah, they were much bigger into theory and then figuring out why, why, why these things. So that's what, by the time you get to the Roman period, they're already speculating about universal gravitation and, and a variety of these things that we see in modern science. Uh, they were toying around with this stuff. And, and you'd mentioned like astrology and astronomy uh, being very closely entangled, but there were debates even in the community there. There were astronomers who thought astrology was bogus uh, and then there were astronomers who thought it was legit, uh, and they did keep these two uh, separate. So Ptolemy, for example, wrote treatises on astronomy and a treatise on astrology, and he was he was a pro-astrology guy. Uh, but he kept them separate, and he actually explains methodologically why he keeps them separate. Uh, so they were, definitely have the scientific consciousness that these are separate pursuits, different sciences. Uh, so even the people who are pro-astrology, they're trying to make it scientific – still see it as different, uh, a different science than astronomy proper. Okay. Um, 
my my uh, again uh, Eddie uh, uh, moving along. This is about science and technology. So there, um, we do know that a lot of what we know about Greco-Roman um, technology or in science intervention and in innovation has really been a matter of archaeology in the last 100, 125 years. We'll focus mm -hmm. on the better archaeology of the last, you know, five or six decades. Um, yeah. A lot of people may not be aware that the Romans themselves towards the, the you know, middle part of the empire were starting to begin industrial level manufacturing and processing which i don't think people understand like at places like barbagall and right. in rome that there were these massive industrial we'll call them pre-industrial to make some of the people happy pre-industrial <laughs> complexes um and i was wondering yeah, if yeah, you they, wanted to maybe discuss had, those at all yeah they had their own industrial revolution where it was the water power revolution uh and this has changed in the field in the early 20th century there used to be the denigration of the Romans of like, oh, they just they knew about water power, but they underexploited it. And it wasn't until the Christians in the Middle Ages and they finally figured it out. Uh, but that's been completely overthrown, uh, partly by reinterpreting evidence, but also, like you noted, so much more archaeology uh, has discovered. For instance, now we know they had water powered sawmills. They had water powered stone mills. Uh, they had auto obviously automated flower factories, like you mentioned Barbagall, which is something like 32 water wheels. And they, they built an aqueduct to feed the power supply for this massive facility that produced a ton uh, of flour out of the grain that would be supplied. Uh, and that's been reinterpreted. It, it was at one point thought to be, oh, this is a, something they built in the fourth century to supply the army. But now we've archaeology has completely redated it. it. It's actually early second century. And it was actually... A commercial enterprise. So we had actual capitalism going on here. We had wealthy individuals got together, formed what then was the equivalent of a corporation to build this thing uh, to, for efficiency of scale so they can make tons of profit off of, you know, monopolizing the grain local flower market, essentially. Uh, and, so, and, so, yeah, that, that kind of stuff was, was going on back then. And we're finding more of these. Like Barbagall is not Correct. It's not yeah. a one-off. We, we, we have yeah. similar, th th throughout the Roman world, these industrial centers, for lack of a better term, seem to have been how, A, Rome was feeding the general populace, not just the military, which was the earlier hypothesis, which you mentioned, but also the the transition to a economy of where stuff is made, not necessarily where it's processed either. Yeah, you know, uh, right. a, we should talk about other industries. Economy. Uh, we have examples of chandeliers that... that Parts were manufactured in different locations, brought together and assembled. Uh, we have uh, production line uh, systems out there. Uh, one of the interesting ones is there's a um, there's an entire fish factory uh, located near Rome uh, that we fully excavated, and it had its own fish farm. It had a tidal pool that would trap fish. Uh, it was all engineered for this purpose, and then they would um, collect the fish and then process it, and basically in a cannery. Uh, they didn't have cans, but they had pots and jars. They were using glass and they were using uh, mostly clay, but they're also jarring stuff. So they were actually turning fish into garum and other products uh, for shipping. And they had a lot of machinery involved in this factory operation. And it was this this whole, you know, basically one-stop shop for like collect the fish, process it and ship it out. Uh, so they, 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 at an industrial scale, which is the fascinating thing. But uh, one of the interesting examples that I always point out is if you ever go to the British Museum, uh, there's a spot in the British Museum where they show a water wheel and it's, uh, it's the, the human powered one. So it's a water lifter wheel, not a, a powering device, but it's, it's, you know, a slave would run in it and it would lift water out of a mine, for example. And it was found in the mines uh, there. And, but the interesting thing is we look closely, it, it's made of a bunch of components and all the components have Greek letters on them. And so we know that we've met, found many examples of these. They came in kits, like Ikea furniture, right? So you'd have all the pieces, they would just show up in a box with all the letters. And I, presumably there'd be some instruction manual coming with it. And so you would know where, how to connect the different parts together to make your wheel. Uh, so, and this is the kind of thing they were doing. Uh, and another example I point out, uh, it's amazing because my uh, professor, William Harris, is the one who gave a lecture on this. And it was actually quite moving, but uh, is nails. Uh, you can really learn a lot about nails. And, and he was pointing out, like, in the 19th century, when they were excavating Pompeii, in their notebooks, there's a lot of they're just throwing away junk that they find. Oh, nails, nails, whatever. Throw them away. Oh, some broken glass. Throw it away. And like the rest of us are like, no, don't throw that stuff away. That's like really important. Uh, nowadays, we don't throw that stuff away. We study it. And there was a nail hoard found. Uh, and this is, 
I can't remember the date of it. It's like somewhere around the turn of a hundred, uh, turn of the first or second century. There is this fort up, up cro- outside Hadrian's wall that was abandoned, but they just set up this fort. Their, the Roman legion was there and they were setting it up, but they abandoned it and retreated behind uh, the, the line that eventually became Hadrian's wall. Uh, but this fort is up there. And what they did is they just buried all their supplies, right? So that the enemy couldn't loot it. Right. So they just buried them, which is a treasure trove for archaeologists. You're going like, oh, man, you can see all of the stuff they have in their warehouse. And one of which is they had nearly a million nails. Now, if you want to think like this is the furthest reaches of the empire, like way out there. Where do you get a million nails and how do you transport them there? What do they cost? Who's making these nails, right? Like this, this shows you the scale of the economy that they had. And not only that, this, they, they analyzed these nails and they found that there are actually six different types of nail, all metallurgically made to a specific type in a different way to perform different functions. So they were actually specializing nail design and manufacturing and, and mass uh, in some fashion. So that, like these are the kinds of things that blow us away and have changed our perspective on ancient industry uh, and technology. Oh. <laughs> um, I was trying to remember the name of the location. It's in Scotland, right? Um, if I remember, I correctly, so. it's yeah. like mm-hmm. I, it's. I know it's Inch because I always joke the inch is where the nails are. But oh. I, um, I'll have to. I'll have to come back. It's like Inch to Two Hill or something like that. That um, sounds right. Is, is, I'm not positive. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah, it's 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 pretty famous. Uh, yeah, and if you're a nail expert, that's where you go to study, right? So, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> Getting back to education uh, and and science, um, in a in a way, science kind of you know helps shape society, but it's also responsive in some ways to like uh, when we see a decline of education and science in the in, at the at the terminal end of the Roman Empire, particularly the Western Empire. Um, what, in your opinion, led well, I, I already know the answer, but I want you to expound on it more. Uh, what do you think uh, ultimately led to the term led to this conflict and uh, in science education being removed and becoming less important in many ways than it had been? Previously? Oh yeah, right. Um, well, everybody wants to blame the Christians, right? Uh, they're they're not. Enti- I mean, they're only partially to blame. Uh, the, it was it wasn't that they were against science; it's just that they weren't interested in it, right? It didn't. They didn't see any value in it, essentially. And even insofar as they used science, they just used it like scripture. They didn't do science. So, for instance, Galen's book just became books. His whole library became kind of like just gospel, medical gospel, uh, even though his books repeatedly say, don't trust me, repeat my work or, you know, test my work, experiment my work, improve on my work. Here's where I'm not so sure and you could do more work. They ignore all of that and just codify everything he said as if it were gospel. Uh, they did the same thing to Ptolemy and astronomy and so on. And, but that was mostly in the East, by the way. The West lost a lot of this stuff. It wasn't until later that the knowledge moved back uh, West. But um, no, it was largely disinterest in this. I mean, there, there's a lot of factors, but it involved the collapse of the whole social system in the third century, where you had basically 50 years. of Imagine our civil war in the United States. Imagine that lasts 50 years instead of five. And then right at the end of it, you have the Great Depression. You have the collapse of the fiduciary economy, like bam, bam. Like that pretty much was the death blow. It was just bleeding out after that, right? The empire was was pretty much a goner. It just took a few centuries to finally die in the West. And in the East, it stuck around a little longer because it was wealthier. Uh, But even that continually shrank and, and didn't last very long. But they preserved more knowledge in the East than they did in the West. In the West, you had a lot of loss of knowledge, largely because... Uh, Roman Empire, when in its heyday, was very much built on bilingualism. So if you were an elite, you were fluent in Greek and Latin. That was just a matter of course. You had to know both. And so, and science, they never developed a vocabulary and translation of science materials into Latin. There's some of this, but mostly it's just encyclopedias and things. To do the actual science, you had to learn Greek. Same way, like later in the Middle Ages, to do anything, you had to learn Latin, right? Like everything was in Latin. Uh, and it was only later, like towards as we get towards the end of the Renaissance, that things start disseminating in uh, what are called vernacular languages, English, French, and things like that. Was, the printing press had a lot to do with that. 
But there was a time where you just had to learn Latin. If you were going to be a doctor or an astronomer in 1200 AD, you had just had to learn Latin, period. Uh, and in the Roman Empire, that was Greek. Greek was the language of science at that time. Uh, in the West, there was a lot less bilingualism, and it died off quicker because of the, the lack of resources to maintain that education. Whereas Greek was the native language in the East uh, for most populations there. So Latin actually shrank in the East and Greek was still around. So science was able to be preserved more easily and more understood uh, in the East uh, than in the West. But the West and the West also got hit way more economically, like it just got torn apart and fell apart quite hideously. And when you get to that point and when you get to like the fourth century, you have even the pagans are shifting more towards mystical stuff. So you have, uh, you know, Stoicism and Epicureanism and Eclecticism declined as, and Aristotelianism all declined, and Platonism and Pythagoreanism became more popular. So there was, even the pagans were, were losing interest in science at that point. They were more interested in mysticism. And a lot of this had to do with the social and cultural decline uh, and, and the chaos and the loss of things. There was a, sort of a loss of confidence in the rationalism of the previous centuries. And so that happened across the board. It wasn't just the Christians. Uh, and then once the Christians completely took over, they had no interest in preserving or recovering any of this stuff. And so we have basically a thousand years where there's no progress in science uh, and, and, and until they rediscover the ancient science. And suddenly a few Christians get excited about it and try to promote it. And then you have this few more centuries and then you get the scientific revolution where they finally get back to where the Romans were about the 14th or 15th century. They get out to the level where the Romans were and then we're able to move past it. Uh, and that's a whole other story as to how and why that happened. I always say blame the Germans. When you want to know why science left the, uh, the Roman world, uh, we can blame the Germanic tribes who, um, <laughs> you know, uh, did their damnedest to bring the Roman empire to heal. Um, I mean, that's true, so, but they were also by that point Christians. So, <laughs> Uh, but were yeah, they the I, right kind of Christians, right? That's the big <laughs> question. They, they tend to be the wrong kind of Christians. Um, I So, again, trying to keep on education, science in the ancient world. Um, do you, accessibility from the commoner. I, I'm, I know from, you know, my own reading and, and research that, like, the Roman military, they educated a portion of the military solely as engineers. If they didn't recruit them, they trained them. And sometimes it was a hybridization of both. Mm -hmm. Um particularly among the legions versus the auxiliaries, but both had fundamentally a cadre of fairly well-trained and then not so well-trained engineers that, you know, acted as assistants to, you know, properly trained engineers. So at least in the Roman military, there was a, a fundamental system and a recognition of education being something that would be accessible to a, a large portion of, of that particular group and profession. But we see that a lot throughout a lot of professions, particularly like metallurgy and in different things, there seemed to be some people who really knew it well, and it, but it seemed to be accessible to even like the upper, the lower upper, the up, uh, the lower middle class and even the upper lower class had some fundamental access to education that I, I think a lot of people don't understand. And I think even in Mesopotamia, we see that with, you know, various caste systems of scribes, you know, scribes that work at the court. And yeah, scribes, I'd be interested to hear just do regular Josh. stuff about that, uh, was there upward mobility through education or was it the province of the aristocracy? Like how, how was education paid for? Who had access to it? Uh, that would interest me. I, I know all the answer for the Greco-Roman period, but I, I don't. I don't know that, I don't know that we know it. Um, so I think certainly in the third millennium, uh, you had a, a vast bureaucracy in the or three period. So right at the end of the third millennium, about a hundred years uh, you have this, you know, quite expansive under people like Shulgi. Um, but, you know, when you get into the old Babylonian period and you start to see these things sort of scale down to the household size, you know, I don't know that most of what we do with the curriculum, reconstructing the curriculum is based on the tablets themselves, right? So it's not like we have... Um, uh, you know, separate documents that say, okay, so here's, here's what right. you're going to teach to the students. Uh, we're reconstructing it based on tablet type. And, um, you know, when we see things repeated and when they're written, uh, there are a couple of catalog tablets, but that, there's debate about what they're, they're actually doing. And they're only for one later portion of the, of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, so it does seem like um, it's, you know, much more, 
uh, of an elite thing uh, than, than, than anything else. So like at, at the city of Sippar in the old Babylonian period, you have a gala priest, a particular type of priest uh, that's training his son. Um, and, you know, so that would have been, that would have been to, to do, uh, you know, to, to learn scribal, edu- do his scribal education ostensibly so that he could follow in his dad's footsteps and do the, you know, the, the, the right. work of, uh, the priest, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that I know those types of details. Yeah. I mean, obviously for the Greco Roman period, I cover it in my book on science or on science education in the early Roman empire. Uh, almost no one, you know, if we want to talk statistics, uh, had access to this stuff. So we were talking 10 to 20% of the populace, say 20% tops had access to even rudimentary literacy training, 10%, five to 10% at most had the more advanced stuff. Uh, you know, when you, and when you get to the science level, you're talking maybe 1% of the population at best uh, did. And, and you mentioned the military, you, uh, most of the actual like literate science stuff, uh, like, like being able to read manuals, uh, uh, on, for example, or compose manuals, like write them. Uh, that's the officer corps generally, right? So these are, these are definitely like senatorial class. They're wealthy. Um, but oftentimes if you're like officers spending a lot of time in the military, you are not the upper, upper crust, right? You're, and it's very similar to like in the middle ages where you have these aristocratic families have too many sons. So they throw a bunch of them into the monasteries, right? Just to get rid of them. So they're still aristocrats, but they're like going into these essentially what look like lower class occupations, but they're educated. Right. And so, and so they're able to like preserve the books in so far as they could preserve any at all. Uh, and so that's how you, and you have a similar thing in the Roman empire. We have like sons who really couldn't make it as, as senators or weren't wealthy enough to get to that stage might end up in the officer corps, like as career officers in the military. And we know they were bringing a lot of engineering knowledge, literate engineering knowledge. There's, there was a study done, I can't remember the scholar, but he, he, he analyzed a lot of like the mining tech uh, that we have all across the Roman empire spanning three continents. Right. And there's so much similarities, like such, it seems like standardization of technology and, and procedure. He said there had to be schools. There had to be manuals. There had to be schools that were teaching engineers. We just don't have any chatty author telling us about them as opposed to like Galen, who tells us tons of stuff about medical schools. Right. So, so there, there was clearly like schools doing this. And if you look at like, and I give Galen as an example, Vitruvius is another, uh, I go through several like Heron t- talks about education. Uh, and so we have some examples of, of who these people were. And like I mentioned, they were, they tend to be upper middle class, but they often came from lower classes like their family did. Right. So they're often like the people in this, in the middle who are trying to get ahead. Uh, and the aristocrats loved science. They loved writing about it. They loved hanging out and hobnobbing with scientists, but they rarely became scientists themselves. Uh, they were too well, busy well, running their massive farms uh, and other industries. Well, science was work. Scientists had to work in the ancient world. And um, the reason I brought up the Roman military is, again, you're right. A lot of it's implied, it's interpretive, but that's what archaeologists do. But we seem to find similar instruments associated with the Roman military throughout the Roman Empire. Like there was there a standardized engineering kit that traveled with the legions. Almost certainly. It appears there were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, which means it was probably formally disseminated. That you could probably pick an engineer that was recruited, you know, um, in out in Egypt and drop him into a unit anywhere in the Roman military if necessary. Yeah. Although we know how military was recruited provincially, and that engineer would be able to function in, you know, uh, 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 not being able to tolerate the uh, the cold if he was sent to Hadrian's Wall. <laughs> but the, the, the we we do we do see that quite quite a bit, and we we mm-hmm. see that the Romans being very practical for their need for science. They, they knew that there needed to be someone oh, yeah. who knew how to build the bridge, but then guys knew who, who knew how to build maybe lesser experiment. I'm just going to say guys who learned on the job, you know, yeah, talented absolutely. commoners, so to speak, who acted as assistants. And then yeah. they got recognized as such right. within can, the military apparatus. Can you make a good wagon wheel, right? Like, yeah, come join us. We'll pay you. <laughs> yeah. The Romans were right. excellent at adopting tech. Like they loved borrowing cool ideas from other cultures. There's a lot of Celtic technology that ends up like becoming kind of the foundation of the Roman empire. Like the spoked wagon wheel, that was a huge revolution in wagon wheel design 
that was a Celtic invention. And the Romans just said, oh, this is great. And then bam, it like explodes all over the empire. Uh, blown glass appears to have been like possibly Jewish Syrian invention uh, right at the beginning of the first century. And then the Romans go, whoa, this is amazing. And bam, it explodes all over the empire until like with 150 years later, you've got a massive uh, glass factory, even in Germany at that time. Uh, so the technology like even is expanding outside of uh, outside of the Roman Empire. Uh, so, yeah, there's there's they were they loved cool tech and they loved people who could make it for them. Yeah, they definitely uh, saw the opportunity and advantage uh, of supporting that. Um, given the, you know, literacy rates that were, you know, uh, I'm hoping that we can say in, you know, the United States today, we have much higher literacy rates than the Roman world. And I think that's, that's of course, that's, you a do, fair, yeah. <laughs> that's a fair statement. We do. The odd, the, it's uh, sometimes exactly I wonder. Worse, right. So we, we might have maybe right. 1% illiteracy here, whereas back then you would have, uh, you know, closer to 90% illiteracy. Right. So, uh, yeah, we are much better. Well, our economy is now so fundamentally based on every, even people who flip burgers at McDonald's have to know how to read and write. Right. So it's, it's our economy is so built on the infrastructure of literacy. Uh, the Romans were heading in that direction, but they didn't get quite to that point. Right. Uh, you could always have supervisors who know how to read and could read things to uh, staff. And we know uh, I should point out slaves. They had a different slave system than we adopted in the United States. Uh, an educated slave was worth more. So slaves often had more educational opportunities than free men did. Uh, people often don't realize this. So like there, there, a lot of your opportunities were to get educated as a slave, you're more valuable. If you're smart enough, you showed aptitude. And then you could buy your own freedom and become a freedman. They had a whole system for this. For, for uh, Buying your own freedom allowed your owner to actually buy a slave to replace you, right? So they had their slave system was based on manumission you know, in, in many ways, not the, uh, the worst assignments like agriculture and mining. Those were dead end murder jobs for slaves like that. You, you rarely got out of those scenarios. Those are pretty horrible. Uh, but nonetheless, we have references to slaves who lead slave gangs able to read manuals that allow them to apply skills and knowledge uh, to the thing. So we, we know there were literate slaves who could even read scientific manuals like a veterinary a veterinarian book, for example. We have mentions of this. So, so slavery was... You know, some people would like look as, as, as an opportunity, like you could get, you know, it was not the best opportunity, but it was a way to get educated and maybe get manumitted. And then your kids would be full Roman citizens. This is one of the, the advantages of that. So people would think long term of their family, like this is a way, a way out, a sort of way of upward mobility for the clan, essentially. Uh, so, yeah, there, that was another aspect of it. But, yeah, there were people definitely there were a percentage of people in any operation who were literate. Uh, and they might have been slave class or lower class or whatever. Uh, they didn't come from the aristocracy uh, generally. So, so this, the aristocracy depended on non-aristocratic uh, literate people to run their empire, essentially. And going back to the Roman military, you know, um, we always, you know, typically um, in the system, you were younger when you're educated. But we do see with the Roman auxiliaries, right, um, particularly men that during their time, in the auxiliaries, and for those that aren't familiar, auxiliaries are provincial troops that aren't Roman citizens, but are going to get Roman citizenship after a longer stint in the military. They receive yeah. a citizenship and a smaller retirement. Um, and these, you know, many of these people were illiterate just because the language that in the region they came out of didn't have a written form of language, but they'd learn functional either Latin, enough Latin and Greek just to get through. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, become functionally literate in their society. So in many ways, the Roman military educated adults. For, for lack of a better term. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, 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 and so, if you were really good at it, like if you were really responsible and survived, uh, you know, uh, all of your service, you, you could retire with a significant amount of money by that, uh, by the standards of that day. And so you could actually hire teachers for your kids. So like they could think in terms of the future because not only do they get citizenship and now their kids get citizenship and now they've got a retirement fund that they can actually use to pay for the education of their kids. And so there's a dream of upward mobility there. Um, um, I, I want to make sure there's enough time left for questions. And I know Eddie's getting ready to jump back in. We have two hours and we're an hour in right now, but I do want to give each of you one more chance to, to kind of jump in. If there's anything we haven't covered so far that you think maybe we've, we've missed, like, I, I would love to hear about anything about, you know, with, um, you know, 
the hanging gardens or anything that either you know dr josh you can think that would be interest to folks and also like um dr carrier i'm going to limit you to like one or two of your favorite inventions in the in the greco-roman world because if i let you say all of them uh, the show yes. end before you stop talking yeah yeah because um, yeah. i have read your book your book your, your the, the second book have, the thick one folks, it's about 500 there, pages right, right i have that section in there where there yeah, used to yeah. be this denigration of rome where they would say like oh they only invented 13 things and, and I was like, that's so wildly false. And so I had to like, I have this section where I just go invention after invention after. I, it's like 200 yeah. things. And I go through them all with I, footnotes. I, I actually was referring one. to that chapter. Yeah. You dedicate a chapter to how everybody else is wrong. So um, let's go ahead and um, why don't we, we'll, we'll, we'll let we'll let Josh have some breathing room. But uh, so your favorite one or two inventions in the Roman world that you think kind of encapsulate the science, you know, how and, and technology. Wait, are you asking me or like Josh? For the... you're, you're, I'm asking you first, Doctor Carrier, just to oh, let, okay, uh, I got you. I'll give Josh some breathing. Um, oh yeah, let's say two things uh, on two opposite opposite sides of of thinking about technology. Uh, the Antikythera mechanism is probably one of the most important archaeological finds. Uh, they had computers. Uh, they were gear operated. They weren't, you know, electronic, obviously, uh, but they had this incredibly elaborate. Uh, computer, an astronomical computer, you would turn a knob and it would have all these dial readouts would change and it would reconcile four different calendars. So you could figure out what day it would be up to 250 years in the future, right? So it was designed to predict like, well, at this date, this would be the date on all these calendars. It would tell you what phase the moon would be in. It would tell you uh, what um, what constellations each of the known planets would be in. It would tell you what constellation the sun was rising in. And it would tell you uh, if a solar or lunar eclipse was possible on that day. And so there's just one turn of the dial and it just calculated all of that stuff uh, with just intricate, minute gearing. Uh, and, and the box itself had all the instruction manual written on it, which is uh, really fascinating. Um, this revolutionized our understanding of, of what they could achieve back then and what they were doing. We had a lot of re literary references to these things. Like people knew they existed and they talk about them a lot, but no one had really, no one really believed that that, was real right uh, they thought oh, that must be an exaggeration or something until we found one and they're like well okay these are real things uh so that's on one side of it which where you see science and technology converging uh, and craftsmanship the triangulation of those three things uh to brilliant detail on the other side is a bread meeting machine right so we recovered at pompeii uh the bakers the bakeries these industrial scale bakeries they had they built a machine where like uh, personnel who were operating the machines could just turn basically this lever and and it would operate and it would just need massive amounts of dough uh, for kneading of bread uh, and so they they invented this machine to if make more efficient the kneading of dough for bread and and that shows like even for common ordinary everyday industrial technology they were coming up with clever ideas to automate and increase efficiency and productivity. Um, thank you. And I'm um, your your first example is the reason I dislike marine archaeologists because they find all the cool stuff. You know, <laughs> the, the the terrestrial archaeologists find bread kneading machines, and the marine archaeologists <laughs> find all the really cool stuff in shipwrecks. But right. we'll, we'll, we'll move on from that. I can, um, I can go off on yeah. a whole dot tangent on that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Doctor Josh, if you can you know, anything anything in the ancient Mesopotamian uh, ancient Mesopotamian world that you. <laughs> you think is just fascinating upon reflection. Yeah. I mean, I think from a scientific standpoint, um, how they thought scientifically and how they developed, um, you know, they wait, they, the way they went about uh, doing early science, I think is really intriguing. Uh, and again, as I, as I always say, uh, not my area of expertise, but, you know, to think about uh, some of the early texts, like Omen series, for example, um, where you have, you know, if X happens, then Y will happen. And how that began, um, you know, with, so the, you know, they, they observed something happening and then another event followed on its heels. So they observed an eclipse and then the city fell or something. And so they made a connection between those two. Um, and then they started to, to, to document these things. Right. Uh, and so this sort of um, going from uh, 
you know, seeing one thing happen and, and another thing happen and then making this connection to start making it predictive. Or they say, all right, so if, you know, for, for example, there's a really popular Omen series called uh, Shuma Alu, which is uh, if a city is set on a height. And it's just, it's one of these long series, I think it's like 21 tablets, but it's just all of these. Wow, um, that's a lot. Yeah, it's it, 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 some of the stuff is really goofy, right? Like if you have tall men in the city, there will be disaster. If you have short <laughs> men in the city, there will be flood. I don't know. You know, like it's some of the stuff is it's it's sort of all over the place. But it it shows how they're they're starting to think not only deductively, right, but in 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 the sense in abstraction because what they do is they say okay well we saw you know twins were born to this woman and they had really great wealth and then we saw another woman that had twins and she also had great wealth and so they started to develop this okay we're going to put these treaties together treatises together that uh you know sort of uh, not only will document all these different omens and these different things that will happen that are the gods communicating with us about the future um but then they start to abstract it. So it's like, okay, if a baby is born with 10 toes, X will happen. If a baby is born with 11 toes, this will happen. If a baby is born with 14 toes, this will happen. <laughs> Things that aren't even possible, right? <laughs> they're starting to think in this abstract form. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's really interesting to me to watch that develop. And of course, as time goes by, when you get down into the first millennium, you had, as you guys were talking about, people that were like this was their profession and they were well known for it and they would memorize these treatises and they would memorize these manuals uh, on how to interpret dreams, how to interpret celestial things, how to de- interpret terrestrial things. Um, but then the king, you know, if you, if you remember, if you guys remember the book of Daniel, um, you know, the king's like, you know, I, I, I see that you're just trying to buy time. You know, don't just don't just tell you. I'm not going to tell you what the dream is. You tell me what the dream is. So this already this idea, right? There's the, you see this idea in the biblical text of um, questioning, sort of being skeptical about do these guys yeah, they really know what they're doing? Right, so you see yeah. somebody like Ashurbanipal, the Assyrian king, um, who goes to great lengths ostensibly to try to learn uh, how to read all these omena, so that he can actually check out. All right, is this, you know, is this, are they really interpreting this correctly? Because I know how to read this stuff now. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty cool, some pretty cool stuff. Anyway. Well, since you invoke Daniel, um, I'm just going to say that, you know, when we look at the gospel accounts, particularly the three wise men um, that we see in Luke, that's, that's a statement. It, it doesn't of, say three. I'll just point if, that out, but. <laughs> right. But okay. The wise men. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. He is, he is correct. Um, Later legend, but yeah, go on. But. But the the issue being that if you're going to have a cultural group be your definers of omens, they're going to come from the east. It's yeah. like you know, everybody goes, why 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 did the why did the Magoi come from the east? It's like because your best wizards come from there. Like like it it, it just like yeah. yes, if you're going to do it, your best astrologers come from the east. It'd be like us saying. Well, the you know I, I don't want to you know, but the best wine comes from this region of France, right? It was just de facto. You yeah, just yeah. you knew it, um, um, and I think people, if unless you study the science, technology, and mysticism, you you may not catch all of these these um, these kind of literary tropes. Now Eddie's here, and I want to say thank you both, um, but he's going to take over now, and I'm going to move back into the shadows, so to speak. All righty. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much, Pat. Pat. Uh, I think you did a fantastic job. I did have a couple of questions before we wrapped it up. I am mesmerized at the evolution of language and science and technology in my opinion hasn't been near the um how should i say how fantastic it is how we've evolved with language and Considering that that's required, you know, before we even get into the more science, the more technology and things. Uh, so, Dr. Josh, 
what what kind of insight can you give us uh being you know in a seriologist uh and the evolution how take us back kind of to uh, the means that they would have used to teach the language as it evolved what kind of uh things would they use obviously they didn't have chalkboards and dry erase boards uh how would how would they communicate these things other than just in an oral fashion? Yeah. I mean, so to go back maybe one extra step, because, you know, I didn't even, it's, it's good that you brought that up because I didn't even think about that. I mean, writing was invented right in Mesopotamia. And if you, if you think about the process by which they came about writing, it's actually pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, so just very, very quickly, uh, they had these tokens at the, you know, like end of the fourth millennium uh, and these tokens and they had them earlier as well. But uh, these tokens represented individual commodities. So like you had three tokens, they all represented one sheep each. They so had three sheep. And what they would do in order to secure, uh, like, you know, I own these three sheep. Or I'm going to transfer them via this, you know, courier or whatever. They would take those three tokens and seal them in a clay envelope, this hollow ball. Um, and then they would roll a, you know, a seal across it or put a stamp seal on it for the owner. And, and that would secure the content so that the guy couldn't like go eat one of the sheep or something on the way. It'd be like, yeah, here are the two that the guy said he gave you. You know, you break the envelope up and be like, yeah, it's supposed to be three, buddy boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, you know, that that's, it's great, but it's not terribly efficient because if at any point during the journey you want to know how many sheep you're supposed to have, you got to break the clay ball open, right? So what they did is they they had the ball, they had the tokens, they would impress the token on the outside of the ball. So if there were three, they'd impress three of these, you know, triangular shaped tokens or whatever, and then they'd seal them inside. And now you could look at the outside of the ball and see three impressions of the tokens. You say, okay, there are three inside. Shake it and you can hear it. <laughs> After time went by, they realized, well, if we impress it on the outside, what the hell do we need the tokens for? <laughs> So then they just flattened out the clay ball, the clay envelope, yeah, yeah, right, and just right. used it to write it. And so that, you know, thinking it through that way and the evolution of how it developed is really fascinating. Um, so so then from a, who was it? Somebody recently, uh, like a pop Christian apologist wrote something. It's that detective guy. Oh, Jay Warner name. Wallace. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just, <laughs> Dr. Jim Major sent me a screenshot of something that he wrote. Where he, it was something like, it's a travesty that, uh, you know, that the ancient Mesopotamians wrote on clay because we don't have any of their records because clay is perishable. It's not until you get the papyrus. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> what's that now? <laughs> I... You're I'm, not a I'm very speechless. good detective. I'm speechless. I am astonished. <laughs> it was, okay. It was bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if that's your research and you failed cop school. But what's interesting about, you know, the way that, that the reason that we know what we know about the curriculum uh, during the old Babylonian period in particular uh, is that we have thousands and thousands thousands of these tablets these school tablets uh, yeah, thousands is probably I mean, we have right now probably about a half a million cuneiform tablets preserved right. yeah wow. so and you can you really can reconstruct the and they're not they're not manuscripts like later copies you can see the thumbprints of the scribal student in the clay i mean that's that's how wow. original they are so yeah. um you know l using using the clay medium uh actually has been phenomenal for us because you, you, you know, you can watch the progress of a student as they learn. You can see how the, the last thing I'll say, there was a type oh, of tablet that's called a, a type two tablet. And, uh, well, so I have one. Type, so it, it, it's, this isn't one, but what they would do is that there'd be a line drawn down the center. And on this side, you'd have the teachers, a really beautiful, you know, uh, oh, yeah. example of the of the writing that the student is supposed to copy. And over here on this side, you'd have the, you know, less 
beautiful version of it. <laughs> and if you turn it sideways, it would be really, if you, you have a bunch of them that are really, really thin because it was a palimpsest. They would do it and then they'd rub oh, it off and do yeah. it again. And uh, so anyway, wow. those types of tablets, you you know, you can see how they educated them and you can see how the scribes practice is really fascinating. It's really fascinating. Yeah, anyway. it's, that is, that sounds awesome. So just a little bit on that, I know you're not uh, a Hebrew scholar, but um, so they say that you can take the ancient Hebrew and you can actually see the evolution of the language as like the Pentateuch. Or not the Pentateuch, the um, oh, the first five books of Moses, the t- uh, Torah. Um, you could actually see in the five books of the Torah the evolution of the language, which is how we know it wasn't all written by the same person. Is that something that when we look at uh, uh, old uh, cuneiform, it, it can we actually see? an addition of words and dialect in uh, what we have or what we have recovered from that time? Oh, yeah. And I mean, you know, you see it not, not, not in real time, I suppose, but I mean, like you. So when you do it with the Hebrew Bible, you're doing it from later manuscript tradition, right? So when you when we look at something like Exodus 15 or Judges 5 and you say, all right, these are, you know, you know, maybe 11th century or whatever. These are old poetic forms for, you know, that, are, that have been added in later or, or things built up around it in the Exodus tradition. We're not doing that because we have these older copies of it, right? We're doing it because we look at the language. We look at the grammatical structures. We look at the vocabulary that's used. Um, and we can determine, okay, this is, you know, archaic biblical Hebrew, this classical biblical Hebrew, standard biblical Hebrew, or this is, you know, whatever, transitional or late. Um but you're doing it all from this sort of final form, these, you know, the, the, the final manuscripts, the, the earliest ones that we have where it's already combined together. Mm-hmm. Whereas with cuneiform, you have the originals, right? So yeah. like, like right now, if you learn Akkadian, for example, um, and this is something that I don't think a lot of people recognize, you, you either are going to learn like Assyrian dialect of Akkadian, you're going to learn Babylonian. And it's not just that. You're either going to learn Old Akkadian, Old Assyrian, Middle Assyrian, you know, Neo-Assyrian, or you're going to learn Old Babylonian, Middle Babylonian, Late Babylonian. And they're all they're all Akkadian, but they all have significant nuances. There's a standard Babylonian form, which is like a literary type of Akkadian. Um, and, you know, the same things hold true to a lesser degree with Sumerian because it dies out a lot faster. Uh, but yeah, I mean, but you can see it in the tablets from their respective periods, as opposed to having to try to reconstruct it from this final compiled form. So Dr. Carrier, uh, on that note, uh, I know you're not a language specialist, but uh, the Hellenistic period is definitely your uh, forte. What kind of things did we see at that time uh, for teaching these technological and scientific things that we've been talking about, what, what was the medium and how did we see that evolve over yeah, the time? Yeah, yeah. We, we're we even uh, in some ways in a better position and in some ways a worse position uh, than Josh is like the tablets, the, those clay tablets survive over a longer period of time and you have so much more of them. Um well, I mean, we have tons of papyri too, but it's all isolated mostly to Egypt uh, because Egypt was the only environment where papyri were likely to survive. Now, we have some exceptions to this. We have two exceptions. Like sometimes you get a papyrus who gets buried in a bog somewhere and it's anoxic, so it doesn't rot or whatever. Uh, or you have someone who moved to Egypt. They retired, like they're moving to Florida, and they brought their archive with them. Uh, so we actually have dug up uh, examples of archives of like Roman officials that retired to Egypt and brought their archive, their old archives with them. Uh, those are always fun uh, and useful things to get. So, but usually we're getting Egyptian stuff, uh, even under you know Greek and Roman administration. So it's Greek and Roman, but it's in the province of Egypt specifically. Uh, we don't get a lot of papyrus, but we do have one other advantage: inscriptions. The epigraphic, uh, the the, uh, the the trend of the time, the fad of putting things in stone and steel. Uh, or bronze is the case maybe like there was just 
that happened a lot in the Greek world, but it's super exploded in the early Roman period. Like the, the early Roman empire is so many inscriptions uh, that teaches a lot. We can do like even regional dialects from inscriptions and things like that. So uh, a lot of what Josh is talking about, we can do, we don't have as continuous. We have a more spotty kind of random uh, peek at these things, but we can do it. I, and I actually did take uh, ancient Greek linguistics at Columbia. Uh, oh, wow. That was the one course I hated the most because it was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> linguistics, period. Yeah, so, linguistics is hard in a lot of ways. Uh, it's fascinating, <laughs> but it, it was very difficult. Yeah. And But the point being is I did learn all the Greek dialects, and we have so many weird Greek dialects preserved in inscriptions, but not in papyri because the dialects died out or, or were only current in certain regions where we don't have papyri. Uh, and, and then you have like, over time, you can see um, how the uh, the way that we reconstruct how it sounds uh, comes a lot from the errors people make, right? So, like, uh, you know, so you have the Yodicism where you have, like, Ada starts to sound like Yoda, and so people start writing Ada as Yoda or vice versa. And so you have these, these shifts in the way people spell because they're writing the way they think it sounds, and then they screw up. But the screw-ups tell us how they think it sounded, right? So uh, there's a lot of fascinating things you do with the language in that. Um, but you had mentioned, like, can we reconstruct these things? And I was immediately thinking, like, bigger than what we're talking about here is I just read an article recently. Because uh, one of the things I did in Greek linguistics uh, that they had me do that was required uh, was study uh, Proto-Indo-European, which is a, uh, a hypothetical reconstructed language from which all Indo-European languages derive, supposedly. Um, and there's Sino-Tibetan for the Asian side, right? And then there's a few that are neither of those. Uh, like I think Basque and Gaelic, I think don't, they don't come from either of the massive uh, traditions, the Indo-European or Sino-Tibetan, which are the, the two big language groups that, you know, Chinese is Sino-Tibetan, Japanese goes back to that and so on. Uh, but, you know, Indo-European, you have everything from Turkish to you know, Spanish to, you know, some African languages and, and so on. But, um, but so we had to, so we, they, uh, scientists have actually tried to reconstruct what the origin language of all these are by looking at different words. And I read an article recently that the one word that has survived most purely in most languages is lox, uh, smoked salmon, uh, and because the, the you can look at there's certain rules that you find at certain procedures the way sounds change, you can show that that word has been preserved in so many languages across the earth that tie back to Proto Indo European such that the Proto Indo European word for smoked salmon sounded very similar to lox like almost identically like they, that was the one word you could use that they would recognize if you time traveled back, uh, which incidentally tells us that wherever Proto Indo European started had salmon, which tell, it gives you, it limits the geographical regions from which uh, in, the, the Indo-European language groups originated, like how far back they go. Uh, wow. So there's a lot of fascinating stuff you can do in linguistics. I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> it's such hard work. Uh, I would not want to be that. And uh, similarly, I hated papyrology. Uh, I did master it. I took a year of uh, papyrology under Roger Bagnall, who's like one of the world's leading papyrologists. And I loved it and I benefited from it tremendously. But I was like, when I was about to like enter the job market, I went in a different direction. But when I was about to, I was like considering not putting that on my CV because I did not want to get appointed to be in charge of papyri. <laughs> 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 oh my God, papyrology, like trying to translate papyrology was a nightmare. It was so hard and uh, oh. so many ways it could go wrong. And there's so many ambiguities. Right. That was the thing that I, that I hated the most was the ambiguities. Uh, so like, for example, one of the things that I did was I studied because a lot of stuff is an ancient Greek cursive. Mind you, cursive. <laughs> cursive, <laughs> This is yeah. like doctor's cursive. So it's scribal cursive. Oh, is no. A shitty kind of scribble. And you're like, I'm supposed <laughs> to figure out what the fuck that says? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, and I, I just, I hate it. And then you do it, and then someone points out, no, no, it can't be that because it's this. And uh, So I did this one thing. I did this one tax receipt, which you can find on my website if you you know, find the Easter egg on my website. I have a link to my, the whole project I did uh, on this is this tax receipt. Well, it was actually a collection of tax receipts, this farmer, small time, tiny little farmer in Egypt uh, and their family that kept these tax receipts year after year after year. And, and we have a bunch of them. 
and it was on one thing. And so they had, they had like one sheet that they would fold and each year they would keep it in there. And so I was translating this. Uh, and But the one thing that was weird on it was the tax collector was clearly the name that we didn't have, right? So they, we, it was a tax collector we didn't know. Matthew. But it's freaking cursive. <laughs> so we couldn't figure out what the name was. Like we had guesses. And so uh, Bagnall had, uh, like, <laughs> there was like the leading preparologist from Chicago came in. Like we, we had just basically had a powwow at his apartment. Everybody's looking at the papyrus. No one can figure it out. I'm like, I'm sitting here in my mind. I'm thinking, I'm sitting here in the room with like the world's top three papyrologists and they they can't figure out what the name is. (laughs) I'm fucked. And it's it's unpublishable without the name because that's the one piece of data that would be, it would contribute to the field. And so you got to figure out what the name is. Like, well, you guys can't figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) So I I have guesses. I came up with my guesses and they're in there, but I never published it because I could never. And they also said like, maybe you're mathematical. Maybe this was a a ninth, a scheme of ninths instead of a scheme of eighths and and the way that they measured land. And I'm like, oh, I have to redo all the math. And I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) after that point, I was like, Uh, if this is what paparology is like, I do not want to do this as a living. I want to do something else. So uh, it was valuable. It was certainly valuable. I learned a lot. But uh, well, uh, speaking on linguistics. Yeah, uh, speaking on Eddie, linguistics. since you brought, oh, sorry, I was gonna throw in. No, I was gonna Dr. say Carrier, real quick. Pat. Speaking of linguistics, oh, yeah. Speaking of linguistics, I just put on my Twitter the other day. I was looking at negation, and I looked on Stanford Encyclopedia for philosophy, and it had to have been a linguistics philosopher that wrote that article because <laughs> it was the most technical. I, you know, I'm not an idiot. I've been in philosophy for a while. I can usually make out, you know, <laughs> maybe have to look up a word or two. I couldn't get through a paragraph. I was just like, this guy was trolling. I mean, he <laughs> did it on purpose. <laughs> yeah. So what were you going to say, Pat? And I got a question for you too. Go oh, ahead. I was just going to throw in with Dr. Carrier. Um, so I work in Romanian Bulgaria, you know, um, Dr. Carrier is talking about the epigraphic habit. That's the big, nice word right. that we That's use the about phrase, the Romans yeah. like to inscribe everything. And like Ramsey McMullen is this, you know, Cambridge scholar who, you know, 50 Love years ago work. came up with this idea. Yeah. yeah. Why, why do, uh, why do they chisel shit and everything is basically his, his, but he writes it, he's from Cambridge. So he says it really nice and eloquently. Yeah. Right, um, right. But what we see like in Romania and Bulgaria, which, you know, ancient Thracian people is they didn't have a written language. So what we find is there's certain words that the Thracians had to maintain in their culture, religious traditions and different things like that. So they had to approximate either with, and what we really find awful is you're taking a Thracian word, translating it into Greek and then using Latin characters or using Latin characters (laughs) to make a Greek word. And then you have to figure out what the hell these ancient people were talking about. And but that's one of the ways. It's the only ways that we actually maintain and actually can identify some ancient languages because they were preserved in characters that weren't their own. So right. they had to describe a god or a word that was particular to Thracian cultural identity. And so the Romans typically would say, "Okay." And then you have these Thracian auxiliary soldiers we talked about earlier who knew just enough Latin to be dangerous. Or maybe enough Greek to be dangerous. <laughs> so they'd go, well, this is what the word sounds like in my culture. And I'm going to write it down here because it's important for like a funerary monument or a dedication they're making. So that's sometimes the only way that we have those words preserved. And Dr. Kara was talking about Celtic language. In a lot of ways, that's sometimes why we have Celtic words preserved is because, you know, it was approximated to Latin um, at, a, at a different time. So I just want to throw that in there. It's really important. I want to I want to tell a, a quick story. Uh, because the other half of my dissertation was working on liturgical texts in Sumerian. And liturgical texts in Sumerian are written in a, a dialect, an idiolect of Sumerian called Emesol. And there was a group of about, I don't know, 100 tablets maybe that uh, were written unorthographically is the word that they used. And it's basically they're writing them out as they sound. Right. But we don't know what they're writing. And it's not that they keep the, you know, the the breaks or any breaks, not that there are real breaks in cuneiform writing, but like it's they did sandy writings, an awful lot of sandy writings where you, you cross two words together in their pronunciation or more. 
so it's in this sub dialect of Sumerian, uh, and they're they're broken. All these tablets, and they're, and they're written phonetically, and these tablets are broken. So, like, this is a nice whole replica of a tablet, right. but it would be like you know the top's broken off, the bottom's broken off. So you have like three lines in the middle. Um, and I've got all these fragments, and um, so, so it would be uh, just for the audience that doesn't know. Essentially, if if you go to a graduation and they say write your name, so that the person reading out you know, uh, at the graduation can read your name and pronounce it correctly. You don't write Joshua. They want you to write, they want you to write it not as it's spelled, but as it's pronounced. So they'd want me to spell it, uh, J A H dash S H O E dash W A H. So that somebody could just pronounce the name. That's how these tablets were written. And cuneiform isn't an alphabet, Right. It's th- these are syllables. Yeah, each sign right. is a syllable, and each sign has multiple values. So, like the best sign could also be read bod, bot, or till. <laughs> so, so you see, like each of these signs has <laughs> all these possibilities, but it's not spelling it correctly. It was there were a lot of long nights sitting <laughs> with five or six signs and like pronouncing them out loud to myself, trying to trying to see if I understood the emissal the sub-dialect Sumerian word that it was trying to represent. Right, right. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I, I have a chapter in my book about heavily. it. In case anybody's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I was drinking a lot. <laughs> For me. So I was going to ask Pat, being more of a modern historian, um, a little bit more modern. Uh, a little bit what, more. <laughs> what kind of evolution have you seen on the medium that was used to write and teach different languages or uh, mathematics or, or, or any of the scholarly things that we're used to seeing? Well, so I, I study the same time period basically as, as Dr. Carrier, uh, the Roman, the pre-Roman and Roman periods of, you know, we can get all technical, but the provinces of Moesia Inferior, Moesia Superior, modern day Bulgaria and Romania. Yeah, um, right. The great thing is a lot of my people are illiterate. So I'm, I'm looking at material culture. Now, occasionally we get inscriptions and things like that, and that's really useful. Um, dedications in Latin and Greek, Greek, you know, being really good. But I also spanned in the early Byzantine era, uh, era in the, and I think that's what you're referring to is the stuff that we're doing up in yeah. Romania with the excavation of Halmiris. And um, that's from, you know, basically the era before Constantine, but from Constantine and forward is, is where the excavation is currently mm-hmm. uh, working. We're looking at the Byzantine layers, right? Um but yeah, so what what we see with the with the Greeks, the Byzantines, is a pretty good preservation of Greek. They um, we do see the use of Latin even among the quote unquote Roman army start to die out. Greek becomes the lingua franca even of the non officer corps. Like in Dr. Kerr is absolutely correct. A a trained properly trained Roman officer is still going to be proficient in Latin, but at a certain point, sometime around the time of Constantine and then after Constantine. Um, Roman soldiers lose even the, the, like the need to learn Latin has gone away, but the need to learn Greek, which is most of them are speaking Greek at that point, um, are coming in. We actually have a prior to the Diocletian period, we have a group of uh, of uh, Roman soldiers. I mean, they're they're Roman citizens, or at least we believe they're Roman citizens that were recruited in Egypt, and they're sent to the Danube, in you know BFE on the Black Sea, for all intents and purposes, because they know how to operate. Uh, watercraft that are going to be able to circumvent like the Nile's not too much different than the Danube Delta. So you take these Roman soldiers and you throw them up there. And what's funny is we start finding little votive altars, uh, little dedications and and, and votive uh, figurines of crocodiles because they came from Egypt and there's crocodiles in the water. No crocodiles in the Danube. Yeah. But they maintain this cultural this cultural norm, right? So those are the kind of things I look at. You know, um, it's it's fun to find de- de- uh, dedications in style and form to Osiris and Isis that are found in the Danube because we had this Egyptian unit that was at Halmiris um, and and on the Black Sea. So it, it it's kind of interesting. So sometimes I'm not dealing with the people I'm dealing with aren't literate. So we don't have a lot of inscriptions on my site. Um, it's a military fortification. Um, 
the, the inscriptions we do have are, are are largely dedicatory for like different emperors dedicating reconstitutions of the fort and the civilian settlement that's adjacent to it. Um, so literacy is not the primary thing I'm looking at. We're looking I'm looking at transitions in, in material culture for the most part. Although inscriptions are really insightful. I have to say, like I, I went to England. I've been to England a few times and done a lot of research in my field there. Uh, but one of the coolest things I did is I, uh, uh, my then wife and I went to Sirencester, Sirencester, Sirencester. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, but that's, it's a town. It's funny. Cause it's kind of like a Beverly Hills kind of, it's like a shopping town, like an upper scale shopping town yeah. in like medieval buildings, which is kind of an interesting experience, but there was an entire Roman t- town outside that they completely excavate because the town had been relocated. And so they completely excavated this buried Roman town. And the museum in, in town had all of the tech that they found there, like household goods and ordinary instruments, pots and pans, scales, uh, trinkets, jewelry, like all of that stuff. I spent the whole day there just going from item to item because I just loved the everyday technology. Like, say, what did you find in this town? You know, it's deserted town. And it's, it's, it's fascinating to see all just the physical artifacts. And those alone tell you so much about the culture. I mean, obviously we, we do like to have writing because that does tell us even more, but even the physical, even the physical artifacts you can dig out of a place tell you a lot about the culture and their, their, what their life was like, um, their level of achievement and so on. And, 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 and to add to that, it's some, you know, we talk about literacy rates, the average person's representation of their culture isn't going to be in a written material form because yeah. they didn't write. And they weren't literate. So it's the objects that he associated with their life that, that tell us the larger picture. Um, you know, um, you mentioned Pompeii, like Dr. Penelope Allison. I mean, her work at Pompeii is about household goods. What can right. we tell about people by looking, looking at the assemblage in their home if they're not illiterate people? That's well, right. Yeah. You know, you can tell you can tell you can tell a lot about people by who and what they are and what they carry in their pockets and what they have next to their bed and what they put in their, you know, again, what they have next to their toilet, which is in their kitchen or right next to their kitchen. Yeah, you can tell a right. lot about them, you know, often in you know, the kitchen. Um, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Often in the kitchen. Or, or, like I always same, try to, I always try to tell people it's, it's the like, same hole. It's right next door. Goes down. Yeah. Yeah. Your, all, all your, your, your sink is your garbage disposal is your toilet. Yes. I mean, and, and so it was, you, you know, it, it's great in the ancient world. Um, no, but um, yeah. So that's, that's it. So go ahead, Eddie. I'm just yeah. having fun. I'm fanboying yeah. right now. I'm just uh, hey man, I'm with you. I'm fanboying with all three of you. So <laughs> uh so let's close on this. Um I want each one of you to tell me because this is science related, and since I'm a mechanical guy, your uh, I wouldn't say favorite, maybe the most um, what's your, the, the, the technology or the inventor or invention, any of the above that stands out the most to you. And I'll start with, uh, Pat, since he's to my right, and then we'll go Dr. Carrier and Dr. Josh. Oh, go do Josh second. I got to think about this. <laughs> <laughs> so, I like to talk about an invention that we haven't quite figured out yet. And that's the Greek fire Thor of the Byzantine era. How did we make a flamethrower? We, we, we understand the general principles, but the exact concoction that went in it is still the subject of some academic debate. The, the, uh, the reconstructionists are trying to figure out basically it's, it's, chemistry it's, is mi- one of the it's hardest early, things to reconstruct, right. The chemistry yeah. is to figure it out. I mean, we, we figure out how basically they launched this stuff at people, um, but we haven't quite figured out the concoction because, the Byzantines had mastered this, this we'll call it weapon, um, to the point where it terrified everybody. Um, armies were unwilling to go to war at sea against the Byzantines because they had this technology. Um, and so the Greek fire thrower, the Byzantine fire thrower, uh, which seemed to have been accumulation, something they devised on their own because we don't have too many pictures earlier. Like the Romans knew how to, you know, put stuff on a catapult and launch it at people like a ballista. Um, Everybody figured how to throw fire, but the Greeks kind of, the Byzantines kind of mastered this technique of let's make, let's make flamethrowers and then we'll launch and burn a ship on fire and watch all the men on it burn to death because it <laughs> stuck to the decks. Whatever yeah. it was, it was, it was it not only hit you, it was napalm like it, it, yeah. it was, 
It, and, and men would jump in the water and they'd continue to burn according to right. some accounts. That's crucial. So crucial detail. It's and, very much like right. And so, so we can't, we haven't science and archaeology and historians and this emerging field of reconstructive archaeology, right? Where we try to go back and figure the experimental archaeology. We try to figure this out. We haven't figured it out completely yet. We have some good ideas and the general thumbnails are, are, are out there, but we still know how the Greeks, the ancient Byzantines were able to sail around the Mediterranean and shoot fire yeah. at people and burn their ships uh, to the ground and then have this substance that seemed to be, as you're throwing water on the deck, all you're doing is spraying around and making the fire actually worse. So, or, uh, or not having any effect on it. So, I mean, that would be one thing that amazes me, but I, I'm hoping before I die, they figure that one out. Right. Yeah. Dr. Josh. Yeah. I mean, I think we have a lot of that in the ancient world because the aliens, when they, you know, sort of uh, brought down their secrets, they didn't really <laughs> let everybody in on it. So, <laughs> my, Mine isn't nearly as cool as that, but uh, the cedar plow has always fascinated me um, because when they, you, know, you had this sort of, um, you know, basin style along these uh, uh, canals, uh, you know, you'd have sort of basin type of uh, irrigation, but then they started doing long irrigation and when they did that, they also started using the cedar plow. And so you would do these long rows along the, the water course. But there was a tube that they attached to it. And as they would go, they would drop a seed through the tube. And so as they'd plow it up, you know, it would drop the seed in. And while, you know, obviously people listening like, oh, well, so what? I mean, that's but but that was a big deal. Yeah, um, because you pretty know, cool back then. Yeah. And we've got, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, like there's a, there's, We've got we've got some information about it. So there, there are texts that describe um, uh, the makeup of the plow. There are debates between ho, like there's a debate between the hoe and the plow, or the hoe and the plow are yelling insults at each other. <laughs> uh, so we actually learn a lot so about the a, plow. Are you saying you had a, a debate among hoes? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Something like that. There's actually a there's a literary text that's that scribal students had to learn, and it's called the Song of the Hoe. <laughs> which I think is pretty funny. Far out, yeah. Awesome. It took this long to go off the rails. I'm disappointed. Oh. But we did it. But we did it. But right? I get say, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you had Josh in because I, I, I don't know a lot about these things that he's been talking about the, through the whole the whole show today. So I like, I'm benefiting a lot from this. This is awesome. <laughs> well, this is absolutely the case from what you've said. I didn't know a lot of what you said, so that's awesome. It's been a good show. <laughs> If you're familiar with, um, I'm drawing a blank, Dr. Josh, uh, uh, Ken Hoven, he's going to be closing us out on the show. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> he's actually in the other room. I'll see if I can see if I can convince him to come in. So you've had plenty of time, Dr. Carrier. What do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah. So we've gone from weapons to plowshares. Uh, now we're going back to weapons. Um, I mean, I mentioned like two things before, but I'm going to, since you, you asked specifically, I'm going to pick another thing and throw it in here. And, um, so I'm also going to uh, mention someone I fanboy over, which is uh, one of the leading scholars in my field is Tracy Rill. Uh, and she wrote, she wrote, she's written a ton of great stuff in ancient science, but she wrote the definitive book on the catapult. And it is actually called the catapult. That's the name of the book. And it's this massive Massive book. I, it's back here somewhere in my in my uh, library that you see behind me. Uh, and it's just, I mean, she's witty and she covers every aspect from the archaeology to the literature, the sociology of the catapult. Like, it's just, it's the most comprehensive history of this weapon uh, that you'll ever see. And she just did this whole thing on, on just this one weapon, the catapult. Now, when I say catapult, I'm sure all your audiences is picturing the, the, the stick that, like, springs up and has a cup and it throws a rock. That's not a catapult. That's actually an onager. Uh, a, a catapult is actually a much more advanced piece of machinery. In fact, the onager is what they had in the Middle Ages when they forgot how to make a proper catapult. Uh, so because the, the original catapult is it's a tor it's a torsion weapon. So uh, so like you figure like this, the classic crossbow is you have like a spring on the front and you have a, a cord and you pull that back and the spring holds the tension and the energy. And then when you let it go, the spring snaps forward snaps the string forward and shoots the projectile. That's the classic crossbow. So 
the Romans, well, the Greeks actually invented this, but the Romans perfected it. But the, the Greeks developed this tech where you have basically two posts with like a crossbow, but you just have two knobs coming out of these two posts. And the posts you have rope or sinew or in a desperate situation, women's hair, we have actual accounts of, uh, that you oil up and you turn into a coiled spring. So it's already super high under tension, these two, two springs. And then you pull the two sticks back and then it stores a massive amount of energy, like way more than any kind of bow or crossbow can do. Uh, and and they, so they built like basically the most effective weapon, projectile weapon, until the gun was developed. Uh, it's super powerful. But the thing is, is you these two, you know, coiled springs, as it were, had to be perfectly tuned because if they were like one was stronger than the other, it would pull the string wrong and you, you're, the thing would like fly out of the container. It just wouldn't work. So you had to be able to tune them. And it turns out that string or sinew under tension, if you, if you pluck it, it makes a sound. And so you can actually tell whether they're in tune based on whether you can detect the, the, what note it plays when you do it. So you can actually tune them like a piano. This is a weapon that you can tune like a piano. Uh, and so a tremendous amount of power. Now, the, the, so this gets to the, what I'm getting to, which is Heron of Alexandria. It was mentioned that he had invented some new, uh, uh, what was called a Cairo ballista, which was a hand canned cannon. There, there was something you could pick up and shoot. And we actually have, uh, it looked more like a, like a M60 machine gun, like a, a turret machine gun. You see, we actually have carvings of chariots where Roman soldiers are, have one of these things on a mount. Uh, and so it is fascinating technology, but um, ballista. Tracy Real uh, looks at the, we have an actual a fragmentary text of the how to assemble a Cairo ballista. And it is believed that it's Heron's, uh, one of Heron's lost works. And she's analyzing it and she thinks that it's a, what's called an inswinger. So that rather than having the two sticks that look like a crossbow bolt, that it, the sticks actually go inside and you pull out, right? So you pull in and then they shoot like this. Now, that's a hypothesis. I don't know if it holds up, but whether it's the case or not, the Cairo ballista was much, had much more metal incorporated in it. Uh, so it was basically a very fancy bronze piece of equipment, like the highest tech, the highest weapon tech they had at the time. And you could have like just a team of two dudes running one of these things and, and it could shoot huge distances with huge velocities. And if you were to use like the little lead pellets, they would literally penetrate a whole human body. Like they would just go at a range of like 300 yards. Like th these are like, like, and we have accounts where the, the barbarians are getting shot up with these things. They're like freaking out because like bullets would go in them and not come out. And they're like, what the fuck just happened? You know, so <laughs> it's, 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 it's one of these weird like pieces of military history uh, that has a lot of fascinating stories around it about how they just perfected this bizarre technology that was super powerful. But by the Middle Ages, they, they forgot how to tune uh, the weapons. So they, they used just one torsion piece, which is the, the onagers, they just had one. And so, well, I'll just have an arm. It'll just hurl. Uh, you know, and later they invent the trebuchet, which is much more uh, impressive. Uh, in, yeah, in time, yeah, but, definitely much more but, impressive. Uh, but it's still not torsion <laughs> catapult. So these, these torsion yeah. catapults are amazing. And they're actually competitions now where people can show up and, like, show off their torsion catapults and see how powerful they are and how big they are and how far they can shoot. And so wow. it's, just, it's and, still a thing. Like, it's a popular and, thing to, like, rebuild torsion catapults. And they came in all sizes, right, Doctor Carrier? Correct, including like, small, portable in ones. Hand, yeah, they had the yep. small enough to fit in your hand, wow. like a pistol. <laughs> uh, they had like the the rifle version, and then they would go scale up all the way to. I think they had ones that like shot like forty pound, forty pound shot, like like massive, massive things. It would like topple city walls. Like they were really powerful. And the Roman military, keeping good records, like different size ballista were assigned to separate different sections of the Roman military. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. every, every, every cohort had its own, you know, medium sized ballista and then That's they got right. bigger at the legion level. Right. So yeah, yeah. the, 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 the Rome, the Romans scaled up. They actually came up with a repeating version of, you know, of a, of a, they did. Uh, the throw. Romans didn't, but the, there was a Greek design that was a, an automated, right. uh, it, it wasn't powerful enough to compete. So it didn't really end up right. a practical military device, but they did make a repeater. Yeah. I see a future show on ancient weapons coming. <laughs> no. <laughs> so mine is Damascus Steel. Uh, Legendary. Yeah. Uh, 
supposedly has never to this day been recreated to the T of I think the Damascus using technology that would have been available when yeah because it, it's, it's all about heat right so this right. is one of the big things that it to make Damascus steel you have to reach a certain like ridiculous temperature like which we can easily reach now but using machinery that did not exist right. when Damascus steel was a thing so the, the challenge is how did they create that heat uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of theories about it and, and they did have some tech that could have done it but we've never really nailed down what it was I believe it was the uh, crucible steel that they were trying to recreate and using the crucible, they couldn't get to. Well, yeah, you need a hardness. You need a a billows uh, that can inject enough air to raise the heat enough. Uh, And, and, and we do know they had automated, the Romans had automated billows for uh, metal smelting. We know they had that. Uh, and they did achieve, I think, like 900 degrees. I think they, they were able. They had shaft furnaces that could do like about 900. Yeah. But I think Damascus steel requires like 1,200 or something. Like it's a ridiculous. I might be yeah, wrong. Yeah, it's about an that, enormous it's, amount it's of heat. Huge amount yeah. of heat. Well, how do you get that right. heat and sustain it and not kill everybody around it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wonder that all the time now. <laughs> <laughs> So on that, uh, I am extremely humbled and happy that all three of you gentlemen have come on to my channel to talk about this tonight. I have enjoyed every single minute of it. It has been fantastic. I'll probably go back and watch it several times just so I can absorb (laughs) the amount of information. And I think that uh, it's only appropriate if... Uh, Kent Hoven tells us how he feels about history on the way out. Yeah, let me let me let me see if I can track him. Hey, Kent. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I understand you guys uh, want to talk to me here. Uh, I mean, I, I'm Kent Hoven. Uh, I taught high school science uh, for 15 years, and uh, yeah, you know, so I think I'm probably the best person to talk about this because uh, you guys probably all think that uh, that dumb thing called evolution is uh, you know something you should probably be thinking about. But let me just say it's dumb, and uh, you shouldn't be teaching it in the schools. Okay, now, Eddie, I see you up there. Uh, you're part of this. Uh, what is a brute facts uh, podcast? You're probably sitting up there thinking about whale penises, aren't you? You pervert. <clears throat> yeah. How did you know? <laughs> I don't know why you guys are laughing. You're probably a bunch of atheists up here on your way to hell. Okay. I'm here to help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. It is not a good show unless we end it with Kent Hovind uh, and Dr. Josh alongside Kent Hoven. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you guys being here. And everybody, thank you for joining us. And don't forget to subscribe and like and tell your friends about this cool show.